I'm recording. Yeah, there you go. So yep. the first question we got is, why do canals not show up on radiographs sometimes? So there's a lot of reasons why that could happen. It could be that the canal is calcified. It could be uh, that the angle of your radiograph doesn't allow the canal to be shown up. Um, and it could be uh, there's significant anatomy over the top of the root canals. If you get patients with these um, you know, tori, mandibular tori. Um, so when you take a radiograph, all of the tissues are superimposed over each other. And that's the thing you've got to remember is that, that the root canal may not show on these, uh, on these teeth. Um, so there are a number of reasons. I would say most commonly it's the angulation that you take. And I suspect on that, that uh, canine, I probably didn't do the best angulation I could. Um, you probably heard of the, uh, the, the most commonly, the radiograph I'll get you to take as students is the upper canine. So that's the hardest radiograph to take. So it's quite difficult to get a good angle on that. So that would probably explain it. I probably didn't take a, a, an angle that was very good um, for, for showing the canal. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the next one was, can you repair small pulpal floor uh, vertical perfor perforations with GIC composite if MTA not available? The answer to that is no, because the bonding to, um, so first of all, GIC breaks down. That's how it releases fluoride. Um, and it's not a good material for apical surgery, nor is it good material for perforation repairs. Um, we'd all like to think it is because it's there and everyone has it, uh, it bonds to dentine, but it does break down over time. So I would say, I was going to, I was going to mention this, but <clears throat> I didn't want to confuse everyone. But anyway, MTA is like the gold standard material and both dentine or bioceramics are the, are the second, or the, it's the same, I would say. Uh, but MTA has got the research behind it. Uh, bio, bioceramics is fairly new, but has been shown to be just as good. Um, there's a couple of things about those products I'll get into. MTA has much better radio opacity. Um, that's got to do with bismuth oxide. However, bismuth oxide is, is, is the cause of staining, thought to be the cause of staining. So it'll show really well in the radiograph when you do use MTA, but it might be a cause for staining. Uh, if it mixes with blood, it definitely will cause staining, graying of the tooth. Um, bioceramics like um, biodentine uh, have zirconia oxide or zirconium oxide as their, um, as their radio pacifier. So they will not show very well in the radiograph at all, but that sometimes uh, that doesn't bother you. <clears throat> so the answer to your question basically is, if you don't have either of those, IRM would be my, my material, IRM, because IRM has a good um, success rate for apical surgery, so therefore it's good at sealing, and it's readily available. Um, zinc oxide eugenol has uh, good antibacterial e effectiveness. I would, I would go for IRM. I, I would, obviously, I, I much prefer, and I don't use IRM for this, but if I didn't have anything at all, that would be IRM. Well, how would I stick to the evidence-based stuff so far? So stick to your MTA. Yes. So the next one is, what concentration of hypochlorite do you use? So that's a good question. So yeah, in the Irrigants and Medicaments lecture, and I have got that um, on YouTube somewhere, um, I use 6% sodium hypochlorite. This is available through Coltine, uh, Pro Canal Pro. Um, I have used uh, lower concentrations, obviously. Um, the thing I have to say is I, I also, at the moment, we're having difficulty getting 6%, so I'm using 4%. But um, basically, uh, the the, uh, the upshot of using higher concentrations is that you'll get quicker tissue dissolving efficiency and uh, quicker biofilm dissolving efficiency. This is another massive factor because it, it also dissolves biofilms, the, the hypochlorite. So if you're using low concentrations, so basically the, the, the general rule is if you're seeing the patient multiple times, it doesn't matter whether you've got 6% or 1%. <clears throat> you're going to be dressing the tooth, you're going to be irrigating a lot more. If you're seeing the patient once for a single visit, I would prefer the highest concentration possible because you're going to get less exposure. Okay. Um, next one we had is, how do you ensure a good glide path if you cannot get a size 810 file to, wor to working length? And do you manage to safely progress the files to length? How do I what so how do I get the files to length? Yes, how do to working length? Um, 
So if you insure a glide path, if you cannot get a size E at 10 file in. Right, so there's a couple of files that are very useful for this. Um, if you can't get a size eight file into the canal, are they talking about? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's a good question. That means the canal's calcified coronally. Uh, most, most, most canals calcify coronally and, and are less calcified apically uh, because the bacteria have become coronally or the, 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 the leakage uh, is coronal. Uh, so, so a very good instrument for this is called, so first of all, you can use an orifice open, a rotary file, but that has its risks. You can block the canal, you can break it off and then you've blocked yourself. So that's one possibility. That's certainly what I do, but I've been using these systems many years and I'm confident I can do this without breaking the instrument. So the, the technique that I've, um, and because of all our restrictions and stuff, I've had to use a few interesting tools because there's been delay in um, production of instruments and files have been something that's not easy to get. Um, I've started using hand files to unblock these canals as well uh, as a means of saving these rotary files that can be used for other things. Um, so the C++ files are very good, and C pilot files. They are stiffened files. So C++ files are like a 5% taper for the first three millimeters, and they're very rigid, and they are like little, um, basically like little stabbing probes, but they cut a little bit with the tip. And the 6 C pilot file is essentially just a stiffened K file. So it's still a size 6 K file, but it's just stiffened. That's not quite as useful if you can't get a file in because it bends, it still buckles, it's still a thin file. But because the C plus file is has this this taper at the tip, so it's a five percent taper. It's a six, then it's eleven, then it's sixteen, twenty one, etc. And then it goes into like 23, 25, 2 percent. So it's a thicker file, but the tip is still a size six. So what I do with these cases is I would either drill down um, a bit more. Uh, so I'd probably try a six C plus file in the canal and just see if I can open it. And I'm not talking about trying to open it, wind it right down. I'm talking about just pro probe and then open the canal. And you'll get this, this path going with the size six and it's got this taper on it, which will then widen it quite significantly. The tip is size six, but the rest of the instrument is much thicker, um, quite a lot thicker than a, K, than a 6K file. And then I, if I couldn't get at the file, and then I would, I would tend to follow the, the canal down with something like a, an endo tracer or an LM burr uh, to just try to get to the stage where it's open enough to let. So sometimes it's because the canal is, you're too coronal and you need to be deeper. And other times it's just the size of the file won't fit in the, in the canal at start. So yeah, I'd certainly try the, 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 the C plus file first. And then if it didn't, then I'd follow the canal a bit and then try it again. Uh, and then we've got, what's your thoughts on biodenting? So I, I sort of al alluded to that a little bit earlier. Um, Biodentine is a, a, a good product, I think. Um, it's a um, bioceramic um, material. Uh, it lacks the staining that MTA gives you. Um, the only downside is this radio opacity. Um, the handling properties are... I think uh, if you're a new user of these products, I think that the handling capabilities of Biodentine are quite good. I think of it this way, like MTA is like wet sand and Biodentine is like wet clay. We're all used to getting in, in, uh, into the arts, uh, you know, at school and playing with wet clay. We're not so used to playing with wet sand unless you live in Sydney by the beach and you're fortunate enough to have a nice house there. Um, so wet clay is like, comes naturally, I think to us as, with, to work with. It's literally like wet clay. And I have to say, biodentine, if you're going to mix it, I prefer not to mix it in the capsule like it says. So that, that, okay, I'll explain it quickly about biodentine just quickly because like it, it's, this is worth covering. So biodentine says put five drops of water in and, and then put it, the cap, cap back on and then mix it in an amalgamator. This, this never works well for me when I've tried to mix that. And this is a subject that's been brought up at endodontic meetings of how we mix MTA, uh, biodentine. And the answer is that I, I do it. Two, there's two ways you, I, I prefer to mix uh, biodentine. So there's one way you can either do it on a pad, so you can put, put a bit out, put some water and mix it to your specifications. That's, a, that's the actual way I prefer. But if you've got a novice nurse or you're a no, novice with it yourself, you'll want to use the manufacturing instructions and follow that guide. So if you follow that guide, that's fine. But definitely, I recommend not putting, taking the capsule off, putting the drops in, and then putting the cap back on. 
take the cap, cap off, put the five drops of water in as suggested, and then mix it with a spatula and then put the cap back on. And then you, because if you just mix it like with the drops of water and you'll get one end of the biodentine is very wet and the other end's too dry. You need to mix it in the, in the capsule just a little bit before you put the cap back on and then put it in the amalgamator and follow the instructions. So biodentine is good material. There we go. Happy days. So do you always do root canals over two appointments, ensuring the tooth is asymptomatic before obturation? That's a good question. Um, I would say that 90% of the cases that I treat are um, over two visits because there's a number of reasons for that. Um, most, the most common reason is we want to maximize the amount of patients we can see. Uh, so if I see people for, for one visit, then the next visit, we can see more people in a day and get them treated. Um, if you do everything like two hour visits, uh, then you're going to limit the number of patients you can see in a day. And that's, if you're not that busy, then that's fine. Um, certainly when I started in Sydney, I, I was doing single visit a lot. Uh, but now, now that it's a bit busier, we, we, we would recommend it. But also it shows the patient that things are progressing in the right direction. And they like that. Um, so I would say single visit is for those cases where there's a couple of ways that reason I do single visit. One is like if the patient's getting an antibiotic cover, if they're an IV sedation case, I'll try and do single visit. If they're a, a G, GA case, you know, special needs uh, situation where they're not going to be able to come in very much, um, that's where I'll try to single visit. Um, but multiple visits is my go-to because you can see the patient can see progression and healing and they're just more happy. Um, I think that's really important. It's more like management of the patient and the problem and the patient sees results from what you've done. And also the other thing that patients don't like is that you can get flare ups, whether you do one visit or two visits, don't get me wrong. You can, it doesn't matter whether you do one or two visits, but you'll get flare ups. Patients have had flare ups when the root canal is finished and they've paid the bill are not as happy as patients who have had the first visit and had a flare up. They always know there's something to do to finish. We'll be seeing them again soon. Um, but if you have a flare up when the patient's been let go and said, I'll leave, we're done. That's when they're least happy. So it's a good way to manage those cases um, to do two visits. And so if you have the, if have the opportunity to do two visits because you've got lots of patients who need treatment, uh, then, you, then I, I recommend this. But as I said, you can do single visit um, if you are able to, uh, if, you, if you have the time. And I certainly do that a bit in my practice. Okay, next one we have is for maxillary molars, do you tend to do posterior superior alveolar nerve block for palatal infiltrations or anesthetizing the, for anesthetizing the palatal canal? Yeah, so I, I do um, posterior superior alveolar um, infiltrations and, uh, and yes, palatal for every tooth um, because the clamp will uh, hurt when you put the rubber dam on, uh, the clamp on. And one thing patients don't like to do is feel pain when they're about to have the root canal treatment started. Uh, it's just a psychological thing, although they may not feel any pain during the root canal treatment. Uh, as soon as you put that clamp on the tooth that pinches, they will get upset. So you're best off just anesthetizing it as much as you can. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, the patients don't like palatal injections, but once it's numb, you can do what you like and the patient won't feel anything. They're also very useful for radiographs to have the patient numb on the palate. Oh yeah, I suppose. So do you, when you're putting, so you um, give LA and then do you drill your access cavity or do you rubber dam it? You would, you would drill your access cavity? Right? No, the, the dam goes on straight away and then I do the access cavity. Okay, all right. Um, always always dam first, um, mainly because now I'm, I find that um, the soft tissues are out of the way and everything. I actually find with my access burrs now, if I because I, I use a microscope for everything, um, if I don't, if I wasn't to put the dam on first, then I would end up probably getting worried about the soft tissues hitting the hitting the burr, um, because it because the the field of view is um, restricted when you've got a microscope, so you lose the like the the soft tissues and stuff. Uh, with the dam, you don't have to worry about that. So I mean, I can understand why you might start the access without the dam if you were worried about angulation and things like that. Um, but with a microscope, and and you, you get you get this, uh, you, you get. When you get a microscope, you get less interested in things like angulation and more interested in the dentine map. You can see things better. Like you, you get used to the dentine map and you go, that's the map. This is how it works. 
Whereas when you're, suppose when you can't see very well because you've got the microscope, then you will get worried about things like angulation and things. It's, uh, it's an interesting. So it's, it's just focusing on, it makes it easier for you, personal preference. It, yeah, it's just uh, it's just because I have the microscope and I'm used to using it. Yes, uh, when a tooth is very angulated, you do have to think about things a bit um, and think like it's uh, distally angulated, and mesially angulated, the canals meet in a different position slightly, you take your time. But um, realistically, with the with the microscope, you see a color change on the pulpal floor. It's green. So you've got this green, gray pulpal floor and the uh, surrounding tissue, the surrounding dentine is yellow, white. So you can see the dentine map. So when you have got the dentine map, you follow that, not the, not some random angulation. All right. Okay. And do you always treat external resorption defects internally, or does it depend on the size of the lesion? Yeah, good question. So uh, my preference is to treat internally because I'm an endodontist, and also I like to get the resin tags. But if the problem is external, like say on a central incisor, it's on the buccal side, I will try and treat it externally although it's very difficult uh, you, you chip away at these teeth to try and get the resin tags and, and you wonder if you've got them or not and and uh, yeah it's not an easy situation um, so I would tend to treat it internally if they're close to the pulp the size of the lesion does make a difference I mean if it's a large lesion you might as well just go into the root canals and do the treatment internally because it's going to need root canal treatment um, so if it's a small lesion on the say the buccal aspect of a central incisor and it's not involving the pulp, I'll try and treat externally. That'd be my preference rather than burrowing into the, you know, burrowing outside. It, it does depend on the anatomy as well like that. You can see in that case that I showed the premolar, it's a natural uh, inclination to be able to, to cut through the root canals and then just de deviate slightly distally. Um, cutting down onto the root surface is, is possible as well, but it really is gonna reduce the cervical dentine more than you need to. And then I think our final one is, can you touch on managing cracks, i.e. cuspal coverage, and also how much you should chase the cracks when prepping? How, how much I want to reduce the, or chase the cracks? Yeah. Okay, so that's a really good question. A really good question by that person. So cracks, there's a couple of things, extent and direction. So, okay, let's just assume, um, so in the old days, when I had patients who had pain when they bit down, but no pulpal symptoms, no you know, tooth was normal, I would actually anesthetize the patient and get them to bite on a frack finder on that on that cusp and see if they could snap it off. And sometimes they snapped off a little bit of tooth and you knew you were all good and you go, that's how much tooth structure I've got. That's a cracked tooth, but it's it's above the pulp. It's vital, it's fine. We'll just restore it. Crown maybe, sometimes a filling, sometimes a direct restoration, whatever. That's, that's, that's that situation. Let's just assume it's into the pulp and the tooth is infected. So then it becomes things like direction and extent. And also you've got to manage things like, the, for example, the patient's existing occlusion. Is this tooth gonna be a lone standing molar and they're gonna function on this for many years without having any replacement? Um, has the crack arose because of, of, um, of that? And so these, these all play a role, um, age of the patient and things like that all play a role. Um, so, Managing these cracks, we obviously, if the tooth needs root canal treatment, we open up the tooth, visualize the crack. Uh, if the crack is on the pulpal floor, I will say to the patient, there's no way the crown can hold your tooth together because it's on the pulpal floor. Sorry, we'll have to extract the tooth. Uh, if it's not on the pulpal floor, then I will, um, and then we really need to save the tooth, and it's critical, I will um, medicate the root canals and uh, do the full preparation to make sure there's nothing uh, left to chance. Um, fill up the root canals with calcium hydroxide and I'll place an IRM base because uh, it's the best sealing temporary we have. Um, an ortho band and fix that with GIC and the, and the access cavity, I'll put the best of the access cavity GIC. And then I'll reduce the occlusion and I'll say to the patient, come back in six, uh, six weeks and if, you've, uh, if you can chew on the tooth and those symptoms are all gone, then you can, then you can, uh, then you can uh, have a crown and finish the treatment. Um, so that's basically the way I do it. If the patient cannot function on the tooth, then it's unfortunately going to need extraction. And also if the tooth gets reinfected through the crack, then you know that there's reinfection going on. Like they often say to you, yeah, when you cleaned up the tooth, it bit sore for a day or two, then it was great for like three or four weeks, it could chew on everything and then it got sore again. 
that's reinfection through the crack. And if you've done the full preparation, that's why I do the full preparation. You know that it shouldn't be like that. And then again, you say, oh, it's probably getting reinfected through the crack. And that's again, a reason why I use IRM. Uh, it's a good temporary material and it will seal it. Um, so chasing cracks, I don't chase cracks at all. That's not a good thing to do because you're just removing tooth structure. And it's no good if you chase a crack and then say, oh yeah, it stops there and, and it was okay, but you've removed some more tooth structure. So chasing cracks isn't something I never do. I do want to visualize some kind of idea of the extent. So I won't be doing micro uh, access and I'll be doing an access which I can see the extent just to visualize it. So I've got pictures for the patient. And, and this is where that uh, this is where that TV comes in very useful. You just show the patient this is your tooth that's cracked. Patients don't understand if you say your tooth is cracked. I can't save it. Looks really deep. See you later. They don't like that. They like to say he opened it up and he showed me a photo and the crack was really bad and it looks on the you know it's along the pole before and he's he's they like they like that they like your honesty. You've opened it up. You've you know, obviously you have to charge them for the for the for the treatment and that's. Um, they want to feel they got value out of that appointment. You, 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 you did something for them. You looked inside, you took some photos, you explained everything. And I'll even go as far as explaining a little bit about what they can do to replace the tooth. Um, you could have an implant, you know, uh, it will last you maybe 10, 15, 20, whatever years I think might be possible. You would want to discuss this with your general dentist and, and they really value that whole experience. I think that that's, that's where the importance comes in. So definitely don't chase cracks, but show photos, very useful. Okay, and I think that was the last one we have as it's 9 p.m. here. And what is it? Is it 9 a.m. with you? Yes. Yet. So we'll let you get your day kicked off as we wrap it up. Cup of tea for the evening.